Everyone, welcome back to the Content Matters Podcast. We're season six, episode two, and my guest today is Christine Crandall. Christine is an engaging and passionate business-to-business marketing executive with deep expertise in customer experience and experience-led growth strategies. If you don't know what experience-led growth means, that's okay. We're going to be talking about that. Um, She advises CEOs, boards of directors, and sales and marketing leaders on how to align their teams to dramatically improve revenue performance and influence their market's buying cycles. Over the years, Christine has served over 110 clients on three continents, including, and I love these names, Good Technology slash BlackBerry, um, Oracle, Digital Reality, CSIRO, Cloudera, Playvox, IntroHive, and Pantheon.io. Um, Christine leverages a lot of her personal experience of having been in the trenches and moving the needle in her writing, her blogging, and her speaking. Actually, that I think is where Christine and I first met when she writes for CMS Wire and I used to work there. So um, we've I've known her for quite a while. Her approach to marketing and strategy has led to the recognition of one of Silicon Valley's most influential women by the Silicon Valley and San mm-hmm. Jose Business Journal. And wrap it up, Christine has sit on several boards. She's on the Canadian Ontario Innovation Cluster and she shares her thought leadership, like we said already, in numerous articles, Business Week, Forbes, CMO.com, CMS Wire, Investor Business Daily, and lots of other um, publications. So Christine, thank you very much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Barb. It is really my pleasure. I'm really excited and looking forward to the conversation. Going to be a good one, I know for sure. So let's kick it off. You say that customer experience is both a mindset and a business strategy. What do you mean by that? Uh, You know, that's a really good question. You know, business has for decades, and we could probably argue probably for hundreds of years or maybe, you know, a hundred years, been primarily focused on acquisition of customers. And so that you see reiterated in the quarterly reporting that's done for public companies to the street, where the emphasis is on revenue growth at almost any cost. And the result of that is it perverts company culture and planning. And it and it introduces this bull whip, whip effect. And we've just we've just seen it. We've just seen it in the last year. We've seen it in the last two years where companies over invest and because they're trying to drive revenue and again at any cost and then the revenue because the underlying fundamentals start to soften the revenue drops and they start you know reducing uh, headcount and rifts and it creates this bullwhip effect when we talk about getting stability and getting predictable sustainable growth what we really need to do is we need really need to focus on that customer and understanding the relationship to what is it that the customer wants and how do they define value and how do they behave and how do they want brands to behave um, and the brand then aligns to that and i hope we talk a little more about that um, in order to drive growth so we're, we're coming at it backwards and when i talk about it being a mindset the mindset is not about i'm going to acquisition and uh, focus on acquisition and it's about these processes and, you know, experience is some other thing that belongs to marketing or someone else in the organization. It's flipped the other way around that says, I look at everything through the lens of the experience and it is baked into all parts of my business from finance all the way through to, you know, shipping something and, you know, out, out the door um, and logistics. So, that's really what I'm focused on is 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 flipping that is flipping that understanding of what customer experience is. So there's there's lots of studies that show that customer experience falls short, especially from the consumer perspective. If 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 it's so important and we have to look at it so holistically across the organization, why are so many uh, companies not good at it? Well, you know. Um, there are a series of gaps uh, in the experience. And if I want to just start off with some simple ones, one is there's a gap between what the customer expects. And and when I use the word customer, we're using generically. We're talking about your ICP. We're talking about your target buying and buying teams. And so this gap between what is it that these teams and this customer expects 
And what is the vendor's perception of that need? And they could be as far apart as the Grand Canyon, the you know either side of the yeah. Grand Canyon. So yeah. that's one gap. The other gap is the customer's definition of value um, and relationship compared to the vendor sales cycle. And, and I've written a lot about how that gap is pretty significant and it results in lost revenue and it results in churn. And so we have this gap here, you know, how does the, the customer define revenue? You look at company structures and reward structures compared to really what is it that is needed to support the customer the way they want. Classic example, you can't call anybody, right? Uh, and I had to call, unfortunately, the IRS um, uh, earlier this week and, it, you know, trying to navigate be around the IVR system like was literally 30 minutes until I found the right combination of the ones and the twos and the fours in order to actually get to a real life human being. Um, and, and that also reflects in the re reward structure. We compensate salespeople on quota. We don't compensate them on the relationship and the depth of that relationship and the quality of the relationship. So it creates this gap. Next one is automation obsession versus the customer response expectation level. Chatbot is the prime example in that, in where it's used by organizations to save money and it pisses off the customer. And then you've got the last one, which we've we've all been plagued with, which marketing is focused on features, um, whereas the customer is really focused on an outcome and a product is a means to achieve that outcome. And so we have these these gaps that have been persistent for quite for quite some time. You know, to get around those gaps is really understanding that that customer's journey and in the objection I get is that well I can't do that there are hundreds of journeys well that's not really the case you know there are really only about three to five journeys by line of business and you know five is is pretty uncommon there's usually around three um, but by understanding the journey of these ICPs and aligning your processes and your touch points to that, again, it's not that hard. And then you institutionalize that alignment. Um, that is how you get around those gaps. And I really do believe that the biggest underlying reason for those gaps is one ego and hubris, right? You know, as a company, um, we know best. And the other is fear, right? It's fear of talking to the customer. Oh my God, what are they gonna say? Oh my God, what if they're unhappy? It's not what happens. It does. It must happen sometimes, though. Customers are not happy. But um, so okay. There's only three potential, three possible journeys. You're saying. So how does that work? Like because um, every journey, every every customer's journey is different. But I guess they can align to a certain kind of structure or layout, roughly, that you can kind of map out, right? Well, exactly. So when you again, we're only talking about ICPs, right? Mm -hmm. We really because really those are the, the folks that we want to have as customers yeah. at a very granular level. Right. So let's say we are talking about um, the moon versus the earth. Right. If we're on the earth at a very granular level, each individual journey, let's say you and I are going to buy a car or your journey, and my journey will differ. They will not differ so significantly, but they will differ. If we go up to the level of the moon, then, then the journeys are the same, but then they're not actionable. There is a mid-level in between. And that's really where you know I spend a lot of my time focusing on saying, if we were to take it up and say, at an industry persona, geography level then i can be then i can define an actionable the keyword is actionable who did who did they talk to where did they go what did they do and why mm -hmm. um and how then all of a sudden we've got something that ac accommodates these slight differences in between um, at the lower level and you actually can do something and that level of the journey 
is what um, is what organizations ought to align to. And when they do that, it's amazing what happens. You can get rid of half of your content um, because customers don't look for it. You're able to understand where the breakdowns happen between marketing and sales and engineering and customer service and start to really focus on how do I actually have workflows and how do I have process flows that deliver a consistent experience that the customer wants and values. Um, because what happens, and then I'll stop talking, because what happens when there is a breakdown in that experience, meaning that I have one experience with marketing and I have a completely different experience when I go to a customer success manager in my relationship. That difference damages the credibility in the band, in the brand and it ripples forward. Right. So it's that mid level and you're, and it's really not that hard to go and, and get that data. I've never really thought of it that way. Like, I mean, everybody talks about how, well, there's one journey roughly, but it can go a whole bunch of different ways, depending mm -hmm. on what persona you're trying to hit. But I never really thought, well, there is kind of a middle ground that if you work with that middle ground, you can hit most of the people and get most of the results. And that's true. Um, yeah. So I do it and have been doing it for a very, very long time using qualitative research. Um, because I want to understand why. Yeah. And the why is really that core to understanding why does, why, why does someone, where did they start this journey, right? For instance, in there's always a trigger event. So we're talking B2B, it's the same in B2C, but it's slightly different. So let's just stick to B2B. In B2B, there are three trigger events. I don't care if you're selling a John Deere tractor or you're selling a piece of big data application and that would be used in the government um there are three triggers the trigger is either reactive something happened mm -hmm. um and and i have an oh bleep moment right and i have a problem something proactive meaning i see an opportunity and i want to capitalize on that opportunity and the last one is curiosity and curiosity oftentimes is mistook or mistaken, better English, <laughs> is mistaken as being, oh, my God, they want to buy. No, 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 no. They're just curious. And and so starting off from those those three journeys, you may find that if so long as I so long as you're interviewing in, in true qualitative research, right, you're interviewing that same group, that same buying team, those same personas across you know, these companies in that geography, and you're able to then see how those journeys differ um, between those three those three trigger events. But understanding the trigger events is the very first point because the journeys are different. And you're then able, if you're using BDRs or SDRs, you're then able to, to spot which one's reactive, which one's proactive, and which one's just curious, right? So flip the curious ones off to be nurtured and have a relationship build and focus on the other two in a, and again, a slightly different manner. Yeah, I like that. Put the curious ones in an audience building kind of nurture thing so that when they maybe decide they are ready or they're reacting to something that happened, you're top of mind when they want to focus. Exactly, and exactly. And this is where I believe a lot of companies in this quest for constant acquisition um, drop the ball. Right. That that curious person or that curious buyer um, doesn't score correctly if we're doing lead scoring or doesn't follow a particular path if we're using six cents for something like that. And they wind up getting shuffled off um, when really the opportunity is if they fit the ICP is to build a relationship with them and understand why are you curious? Is it in the case one company? that I distinctly remembered when I was doing um, some interviews, it was like, well, we're curious because in a year's time, we're going to start a project to replace whatever. Well, what a phenomenal opportunity to build a relationship and be first in the line and have preference versus, you know, tagging them as, you know, as, as something to be thrown into a nurture, cam nurture campaign. The other thing that's equally interesting, and then again, we're now at the other end of the journey, is and I heard this a lot last year 
was just because I didn't select you doesn't mean that I never want to hear from you ever again. And it really? has, and it, it creates a complaint. So the complaint that I heard is again B two B. We're talking about ASPs around hmm, twenty thousand to up to you know a hundred thousand was stay in touch with me. Um, I didn't select you or we did not select you for a whole host of reasons, but I like the experience. I like the relationship. I like the product. You know, I saw value. I got value. Stay in touch with me. Call me every six months. And that is a huge missed opportunity for virtually every brand that I talk to because they tag them as closed, lost and Salesforce. And then they go off into the ether and they're never re resurrected again. Um, Huge missed opportunity. I, I would say, and I've, I've actually never thought of that. I would have thought, why why bother keeping in touch? They've they've selected another product, but what if they're unhappy with that other product? What if it doesn't work out? Well, and that's exactly the point, right? It, that why isn't discovered in NPS. It's not discovered in a survey. You're not going to find it out by. Um, sending out something to the custom the the lost prospect about you know what is it in our product that you didn't like nine times out of ten literally has nothing to do with the product and has nothing to do with price though that's different in government um it has to do with something else if we don't have this conversation like you and i are having and ask why right and get the context of the journey then we make assumptions and we all know what happens with that um, and that's the biggest opportunity when when I talk to companies and I talk to boards is saying, if you don't have context, you're getting data points that appear to tell a story, but they don't. Yeah. OK, so is this where you talk you talk about the idea of experience led growth? Is that kind of part of how you get to all this information and build this kind of go to mark market function? So experience led growth is an approach to um, a strategy plan. Um, and I kind of and I came to it. I do a lot of strategy, strategic planning in addition to a lot of understanding the customer because they kind of go together. Right. In my mind, if I don't know what the customer is doing and I don't know what the trends are in that industry for the next five years, um, I, I can't really guide an organization to build a strategic plan, which is measurable and which is, um, is live and sustainable and valid for the next several years. Um, and so the approach, when you bake in, understand the experience into your strategic plan, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, is it results in two time the growth in revenue and it results in what I call um sus, you know sus stability right meaning I can I can have confidence in my objectives I can have confidence in that I'm going to achieve that if I execute the plan and so the I the principle that sits behind it is that experience is something that we as an organization deliver. I mean, BMW probably does this very, very well. Salesforce does it as, as equally well in a different way. But the notion of BMW is I am taking the experience in which I am going to differentiate on, which my ICP wants, and I'm going to bake it into my mission, my vision, my mission, my goals, my objectives, and my OKRs. So it isn't Experience isn't where we leave it now, which is on the tail end in some marketing campaign or wrapped around something in CSMs. It is very much throughout that entire experience. So when we go to BMW, for example, um, then it's it is their view of experience then becomes a whole lot more holistic. I'm not just delivering experience to that customer and I'm not delivering a differentiated experience just to the customer. I really need to look at that entire ecosystem because my customers are also possibly my employees. And if my employees are not having a quality experience as they as they um, value it, then you know what? They're not going to do a really good job. And that's going to be, you know, 
communicated to suppliers who could be customers and suppliers could be living in our community. So you start to see where the change starts to happen. And yeah. we, we as an industry tend to view experience in isolation, right? You know, that's something that somebody does over here and there aren't, there are no ripples, but experience drops is like a pebble dropped into a puddle and you see the rings coming out. So it has to be in every aspect of your strategic plan, whether again, it's finance or R&D. It's not a separate uh, goal and objective because then that puts in isolation. It is baked into all of the goals and all of the objectives. Now, all of a sudden you, you have a much more um, one customer led business you're being, you're, you're aligning to where your customers are going, not the other way around where you think that's going to happen. You're aligning to that. And you also have that ability to evolve and to change as the customer will inevitably evolve and change. It's a whole lot easier to do it that way than to sort of guess and react. Are there a lot of companies that that they they can't buy into that that they have trouble buying into that concept of it not just being a role that's played separately but you have to bake it into everything that you do and think about there yeah they do struggle with that and and it it comes back to um a number a number of things uh, i i'm always sad and disappointed in that the number of organizations that don't do strategic planning uh it are you know, the majority, right? It's like, oh, well, <laughs> the world is too unpredictable. You know, I can't really plan and hence the bullwhip effect. But, you know, we planned expenses to ad nauseum and we're going to plan revenue um, by, you know, what I call Excel, uh, bit fiddling with the Excel on the salesperson's quota. Um, but we don't plan all the rest of that business because it's too unpredictable. Um, it's a little lot like flying a plane in, you know, in fog and hoping like, heck, you don't hit the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, and, but the companies that do that, right, that do embrace on strategic planning, that use the planning tool as a way of aligning each individual in the organization all the way back up to the top so that we have accountability. We also have employee experience of ownership right? When you can connect the dots between this is where the business is going, this is where we want to take the business, and this is your role. I mean, that was something that that when I was at Ariba and I was at the CMO, my strive was to connect the dots from for the, you know, the, the 40 people that work for me around the world, because then I could then manage by outcome. I didn't have to micromanage. I could allow them to do their job and I could allow them to grow because they knew if they did this very well, whether it was demand generation or whether it was events or whether it was product marketing, then it would actually um, show up and impact the attainment of, you know, measurable and time bound objectives. And, and so at the same time, if you bake experiences into that and the employees understand if I manage you know, the experience, meaning I know when it's a critical issue that 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 customer can reach me by phone, which we have countless studies that have shown that regardless of generation, regardless of gender, people want to talk to another human being when there is an issue, like calling the IRS, right, then structured accordingly. And that call center agent, if they understand where they fit in that chain versus being stuck into a, a dark room as a call center agent and not really being the dots connected, then all of a sudden that experience is that they're going to deliver is going to be very different. It's going to be much more personal, which I have to say, when I ultimately got to the IRS agents, they were amazing. They were absolutely amazing. <laughs> okay. All right. So I, okay. So that kind of makes a lot of sense to me. And, and I can see why people would struggle with it because it's, it's so big to think about, but, um, but it's commitment. But it's, kind of, but it's this thing called commitment, right? If I'm going to do a yeah. plan and I'm going to like align all my employees by golly, I actually need to commit. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we, we don't always like commitment or accountability in our culture nowadays. Mm, right. Okay. All right. So let's talk about customer experience. Um, 
it's not that it's easy to understand it from a marketing perspective and a customer support or service perspective, but it's a lot more talked about. Where you don't really talk about it, and you kind of did a little bit already, is where sales fits into the customer experience. Like, what what is their role to play now? Yeah, I. And again, we're B two B, right? So we're not talking yeah. about you know low value, low S ASP products. Um, sales plays and has a very significant role. And and having been on the marketing side of the house for a significant part of my career, uh, what I and then going into customer experience and running my own business, what I basically s saw was that sales sales is hampered by our current or current the way we currently run business and has been for decades. So marketing will go off and do lead generation. I'm doing air quotes, right? They're going to do demand. They're going to create demand. And we can talk about that, but they don't really create demand. They identify you know, these triggers that are active, who has them. And then they're going to throw them over the wall to sales, right? So sales is immediately not equipped and provided with information upon which to build a relationship. And then sales closes the deal and they throw it over the wall to the CSM. When we look today um, at where companies are going and where customers are expectations, sales need to do what they do very well is build relationships. So let me kind of tell you, share with you a couple of points in what is driving the expectation of customers, right? This is B2B, right? They're expecting know me, engage me, delight me, empower me, hear me, help me. So these are six factors. And I'm going to repeat them again, because they really warrant um, repeating. Know me, personalization, when I call in, hi, Christine, right? Are you calling about blah, right? Um, engage me, meaning if if I live on Twitter or I live on email, which is typically where I live, um, then engage me in those channels and engage me as if you have some contextual awareness of who I am. Delight me. This is the we are in the experience economy in the experience age. I mean, a, a brand that does it very well happens to be a consumer brand is Karuma, right? They sell these eco sneakers and they have wonderful ways of delighting customers by sending you free insoles or telling you how many trees they planted. I mean, it's just unexpected ways that are very delightful. And again, it's a bonding mechanism between the brand and the customer. Empower me, give me information. This is where the financial services industry is moving towards to help people to do financial planning, to plan for the houses, right? Banks have no alternative if they wish to survive. They have to empower and actually um, become partners with their customers, right? Nobody wants to go in the bank anymore. It's like, you know, oh my God. Um, but that's where banks are going is empower me, hear me. Meaning if I, if I ask a customer for a survey, respond, right? Close the loop. That's the minimum expectation of customers. You know, how many times have we filled out Qualtrics surveys or Medallia surveys, and then it goes off into ether and you close. The odds of you know you filling it out again are zero and none. And the last is help me, meaning if I have an issue, be there. So these are some of the basics that that we really need to 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 take in. And salespeople can help be that gluing mechanism and help in every one of them. Um, I am seeing companies starting to drop BDRs and SDRs um, because they don't have one the experience. And secondly, they don't have the information nor the relationship to fit a lot of those six criteria. And customers don't want to talk to BDRs and SDRs. I mean, I, that was loud and clear in the last two years worth of work that I've done. So sales really has the onus to now build a relationship with that customer. But it starts with marketing. If marketing can't equip sales with this is the in journey, this is the engagement that that particular account has had on their journey. This, these are the assets. This is the sequence. This is the time frequency. This is who from the account engaged based upon persona. You know, then we're not equipping sales to be successful to build a relationship. So the whole organization needs to really focus on enabling sales um, 
and to, again, help them to build that relationship and be equipped with information to do that. Um, so I'm going to just stop, stop talking there because I'll just keep going. <laughs> No, it's, 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 it's funny. I just, I did an interview this morning with um, the chief product officer of sales loft and they mm -hmm. just acquired drift, right? And this was the exact thing that she was telling me to equip sales with all of these things to help them build better relationships. So it's, it's, it's like, yes, I hear you. It's just, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. I mean, I, when we did the journey mapping for good technology, one of the techniques that I use, um, this is, pre-COVID, right? There's pre-COVID and post-COVID, it's like ice age, you know, new ice age, um, is we used to do them in face-to-face -face and I would take, in, the, in Good Technologies, um, the head of GAMS, Global Account Managers, a phenomenal salesperson by the name of David Roth, went with me. Um, and the deal was, you can come with me to these interviews. These are Fortune 500 companies we, we were doing journey mapping with, but you can't say anything in the room and you got to sit within kicking distance because if you open your mouth, I'm going to kick you. Um, and in every one of the cases, he walked out and he was like, I had no idea. <laughs> and and, and it, it really, that was a foundation or the impetus for really completely overhauling how sales and marketing actually work together at good technology and how they became one team. Because it was this, oh my God, I had no idea. That's, that's very fascinating. Oh, okay, so that's sales. And then they turn it over to CSMs. Oh. In the case of SaaS, then we've kind of got this problem where, yeah, someone might sign up, but getting them onboarded is not working. And then getting them to stay past that and actually use the product is a challenge where do you, how do you work the experience to improve that situation? Right. Uh, it's the same process, right? When we look at journeys, right? Um, so many folks are po focused on the purchase journey. Uh, when I look at a journey and I'm working with a company um, and that regardless, I'm working with a door company now, right? And we're looking at that entire journey because there are expectations post-purchase. Uh, they may not be articulated to the salespeople. They may not be articulated to anybody in the organization. Again, it is the responsibility of the brand to understand and align to the expectations of the journey. It is not the responsibility of the customer. Uh, but they, you know, they have expectations. So we need to map that journey post post-purchase. What typically happens, and we did a lot of work with PayScale to actually fix this, is that deal is signed, right? It gets lobbed over the wall to CSM or to whatever organization, whatever you want to ca call it. And the CSM is, at a, is immediately at a disadvantage. So what was done to sales at the lead is what sales does to the CSM on the, on the sale is to yeah. say, okay, you know, company XYZ purchased this, um, here you go. And so the CSM, or that onboarding organization has to recreate that knowledge minus 100 points because it damages credibility and they're restarting that relationship from scratch. Where I've seen in a lot of SaaS companies is that we have in onboarding over touching, right? So we've got the CSM trying to figure out what the heck's going on. You've got an onboarding team that's trying to get these people scheduled to be onboarded. You've got, I don't know, somebody else involved and, in, you know, customer marketing because we want to get customer marketing, you know, get them into the into the queue. And so there's a huge amount of this overtouching, which is confusing to the customer mm -hmm. when the customer is live. OK, so this is terminology left over from the on prem days, but it still is stuck within organization. OK, the customer has been onboarded. They've got all their logins. They're they're using it. They've been through training. I'm done, you know, they now go into customer marketing and none of that aligns with what the customer is expecting. So right away, you're, you know, you're, you're coming out of the box and you're tripping all over yourself, right? What customers have want, and this is what we re-engineered re Payscale on, and, and I advise this for every SaaS company, is to say, 
have that salesperson be that account manager. And I know that's, you know, a very, a very, you know, very a topic that creates a lot of friction um, within organizations. But at as a minimum, that salesperson ought to be on those first three calls with the onboarding organization and prep the customer to say, you're going to meet Mary Jane and you're going to meet Barb and you're going to meet John. And that's what their roles are. So you call John for this and you call this person for that. Here are the emails. Here are their cell phone numbers. They meet them online. And then there's a plan laid out that says, this is the training. This is the onboarding. Does this work for your organization? Do we have everybody involved? The only person that knows if everybody's attending onboarding is sales. CSM is not going to know. Yeah. So we have to have a structured plan, a single point of contact, and there needs to be the questions along the way that how do you, how would you like us to continue to stay in touch? So, so we did work for Streetlight Data. And what Streetlight Data did, which I thought was amazing, was they would constantly, um, and they were primarily selling to the government. So it's a little bit different from a commercial enterprise, but they would touch base with them once a quarter or twice a quarter. Um, how are you? This is what you consumed on the data. This is how you're using our application. Did you know about X, Y, and Z? Let me show you a demo how to use X, Y, Z in context of your environment. So Streetlight Data was acquired by Jacobs and they do mobility big data. So, you know, how are roads used in intersections and bike paths and whatnot? Um, and then they would then they basically would say, okay, how, Mr. Customer, do you want to be contacted? Well, I'd like to do a quarterly QBR and I'd like to get an email on new features once, you know, once once a month. Okay, that was it. So it's the customer driving how they want to be engaged. Most SaaS companies put them on a regular drip of customer news and a newsletter. God forbid, please don't send newsletters, right? No one reads them. Um, they hate them, right? And and so they get this generic drip of stuff that is completely irrelevant to their situation and to their problem. So let's just be clear. Let's let the customer determine what it is they want. And this is where you know the salesperson or the CSM has an equal responsibility that says people change jobs. Right. We all saw this over the past two years. So the objective or the the measurement of of the CSM or the relation account manager is how deep and wide is your footprint in that account? I mean, one of the challenges at, at Payscale, and this is some years ago, they've you know fixed this, was HR people, which is who they sold to and who was the primary user, you know, turnover rather frequently. So they would go back for renewal only to find out that most of these accounts had no idea they had pay scale. CFO had never heard of it. And so what do you so they didn't renew. Right. So there has to be this this relationship build, which is deep and wide within an organization. And it's not about, hey, you know, did you use your pay scale today? It's really about you're constantly selling the value that and so that when it comes up for renewal, it's a no brainer. It, it right? sounds so um, obvious that you should do this kind of thing, but I've subscribed to lots of SaaS applications and I don't get any of that kind of communication at all. Exactly. Yeah. And exactly. And then because we're all siloed in the organization and the focus is inward, right? We're, you know, we're focused on budget. We're focused on workflows. We're focused on systems. We're focused on politics. We're focused on who did what to whom today, instead of being focused where it should be, which is on that, on that customer. Yeah. And, you know, and, in having, um, and tiering your CSMs, a lot of, some organizations or many organizations don't. So you've got a CSM that's carrying 200 to 500 accounts. I've seen that. And you're like, really? How's that going to work? That's not going to work. But it's only $19.99. Well, fine. We'll find out how the $19.99 customer, what their expectations are, and deliver that. Chances are they can do it a lot more profitably than trying to make these determinations that you only can talk to me through you know, the chat bot. And it's all about self-help. And if you really get stuck, you know, go to these communities and, you know, and God, we value you. You're, you know, you're, you're a highly valued customer of ours. 
Oh my God, you're just making me laugh because I can just. just yes, as, as you know, on our brains, all these roll in my in my whole brain. It's like I can't mention that brand. I can't mention that brand <laughs> because it's like, yeah, I got some real beefs with a couple of a lot of SaaS applications because it's like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, no. <laughs> okay, well then that leads us to the question of churn then, which mm. is a universal challenge. And is it is it as simple as saying it's a bad customer experience or are there kind of touch points between the purchase and the renewal that can make that less that number less high? Well, the premise, right, the premise in your question is churn is a result of what happens between purchase and renewal. Yeah. And I would challenge that to say that's not always the case. Really? So go back to our trigger, reactive, proactive, and let's just leave curious out of it because they're not at that point yet. In a reactive trigger, something happened, right? It's usually catastrophic. Something happened. I need to go buy a solution. And in those situations, those companies, they could be global um, electronic device, you know, sensor companies i'm trying to like not use names um it could be a financial services company in those situations it's it's i got to go solve the problem and i need to go solve it now they will purchase um less than optimal solution you you, you get where i'm going They're, they will purchase a less than optimal solution in order to address that problem and buy themselves more time and then they will churn down the road when they've actually identified the real, the real, the best solution. So the decision to churn happens before they even purchase. And this is where lots of companies never figure this out. They're so focused on, I got to just close the deal that you know, we miss the context of the deal to realize, be mindful in a reactive trigger that, you know, we may have churned down the road. Um, you So we have to understand the entire journey. The other point where churn happens is between purchase and renewal, but it's not at renewal. It's within the first 180 days. So I buy a piece of software. I've spent a you know huge chunk of money, two grand or whatever on it. And in my mind, in the buyer's mind, that is that 180 day honeymoon is when I decide, I, based upon my experience, expectations, do you understand my expectation and meet my expectation that I decide whether I'm going to keep you or not? And that comes down to how easy was it to install, right? Um, how easy is it to log on? Um, some applications are like, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Um, how responsive was the vendor uh, to my issues? How quickly was it resolved? How, what was the communication? There's all these things that are in many cases subconscious within the buying team. But if at the end of the 180 days, and for whatever reason, 180 days is cross industry. If I have a bitter taste in my mouth, um, I'm just going to, in and it's something I don't, it's not material investment. You know, I'm just going to let it slide. Hmm. Right? If it's a material investment, then fine, we'll use it, but it's not going to get sticky. We're going to make sure that it gets somewhat isolated because, you know, it's, I'm not bought in, so it's buyer's remorse. Um, CSMs and, and and marketing don't tune into that. Some CSMs, the very good ones do, and some organizations are very focused in and they help have health scores, but we need to be a little bit more specific than just red light, green light on a health score. You know, is there buyer remorse? And let's not just deal with bugs, let's deal with these expectation gaps. Yeah. That's true. I never really thought that that that's a big reason why companies just give me something fast now. So we have something to keep going, but we're probably, we might switch out of it when we actually take the time to look at what we really need. Right. Huh? It's crazy. Right. Um, all right. I am, I have other questions, but we're running out of time. So I think we're going to leave it there, except for my last question, which I always ask a silly question of all my guests and, Usually I do a lots of research to find out what you talk about, but you don't talk about a lot of personal stuff. So you're tricky. But my, I think my, my question for you was, um, you like dogs, Christine? I love dogs. 
what is your favorite dog and what is the silliest thing you've ever said to your dog? Oh my God. Oh my goodness. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, so my favorite dogs are cockapoos, uh, and that's half cocker spaniel, half poodles. And I had one, um, she was a genetic aberration, uh, out of the litter. She was blonde. I mean, blonde and she had little brown fleck freckles across her nose. And I used to take her with me uh, when I traveled to go with to clients. Uh, she loved, she didn't like the plane so much, but she loved being with clients, right? She was great when, you know, when, when you're in environments where there's some tension. Um, and, you know, I used to talk to her constantly. Um, the silliest the silliest thing, okay, it's not so much the silliest thing that I said, then it's more the silliest thing that I've ever done. And I did this with a client. So I took her with me. We had a client that was in London, Ontario in Canada. And they had this massive, huge fish tank, right? And there were all these fish in this tank. And, and she was sitting on the floor watching the fish. And, and I didn't, and then I didn't realize it, but two of the employees had put two chairs together so she could get up on the chair and and watch the fish and so she's up on the glass you know uh watching the fish and so um i said well let's let's see you know let's see if the fish will say hello so i held her i knew and, this was going. <laughs> all right i held her and so the this big like this big fish right comes up and she sticks her head under the water and she starts blowing bubbles out of her <laughs> Oh, we actually have it on video. Um, you know, and it was like her and this fish were like bonding and, you know, but of course now she's sopping wet, you know, <laughs> that was the silliest thing I've ever done, but she was just so enamored with those fish. I have expected you to say she jumped out of your arms and into the fish tank. Well, she would have, right? She would have, but that, would, you know, I would, that to me would have been that would have been she would have done that right she because yeah. she was i used to call her dora the explorer because that it was we had another one right i had a little boy um and he was just like mop a floor mop i mean he would never move where she was her idea of a walk was seven miles you know <laughs> <laughs> i love dogs that's cool yeah. all right well thank you christine this has been a great conversation i learned some good new things that I'm going to take away when I work with my clients. So it's great. Awesome. And thank you, Barbara, for the opportunity. I was, yeah. I'm just so delighted. Yeah, it's lots of good stuff. Um, all right. And thank you to Ingenix, who is the sponsor of the Content Matters podcast. Um, they are a leading player in the field of content management and customer experience for over 20 years. They've offered lots of innovative content and digital experience mm -hmm. solutions to customers across the world, like customer portals, uh, web websites, web experience, um, self-service, customer support, knowledge base hubs, technical publishing, all that good stuff. You can learn lots about Ingenix if you go to ingenix.com. And while you're there, just sign up for our newsletter and we'll let you know of upcoming podcasts and other great content that we're sharing. And with that, I'm gonna say thank you and have a great day, everyone.